a little bit about me, introductions, for those of you who might not know me. Um, I have been at the IOYC since 2012, uh, getting on a bit. I am now a third year PhD student where I'm working on developing scientific instrumentation for next generation observatories, uh, specifically working on optical interferometers, which give you the highest resolution of any form of observation in the optical. And if you're interested and would like to know more, ask me. Um, although I feel like the majority of you have probably already heard me talk about it. But there's, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to talk to me. Um, I started working on these atmospheric simulations to study how to optimize optical interferometers. And this was kind of a bit of a spin off uh, this project of simulating a single telescope. But hopefully, you will find this as exciting as I do. So, the plan for today, we're going to talk about how to describe a telescope specifically for our simulation. And then we're going to break the discussion up into two parts, really. The first part will be discussing the physics um, that ruins your perfect images of the night sky. And there's a list of topics we'll be covering here. Um, and in the second half, we will be discussing how to build a simulation uh, for something like this. Um, and again, there's a sort of a list of some of the topics we'll be hopefully covering there. Um, and then we'll sort of discuss how we're going to set up for Sunday and how that's going to go about. OK, so as I said, part one, the physics. Um, I believe none of the physics on this image is the physics that goes into the simulation we're talking about. But I just look for the most cliche physics image that I could find. And there you go. Uh, so the ideal telescope, how to describe it, reflector, refractor, or something in between, as these images show here. It doesn't matter for the sake of uh, the simulation we're dealing with today. You can characterize them all by the same basic metrics. Um, and they are ones that you may be familiar with. They are here. And this is an image of the telescope or the complexity of a telescope that we'll be dealing with in this simulation. So we're interested in three things. The focal length, um, which is the distance from here, the lens, or obviously if you have a reflecting telescope, the mirror, to what we call the focal plane. Um, this is the sort of plane perpendicular to the uh, lens here, where the light comes to a focus, where you would put your camera. So this orange thing here would be your sort of uh, CCD chip. Um, and D here, the diameter of your telescope, and the focal ratio, which is a combination of the two. So just the focal length divided by the aperture diameter. And that's pretty much all you need to know about telescopes for as far as we're going to go with these simulations. Um, so talking about the size of things on the night sky, uh, in the night sky, we describe things as having an angular size. And again, anyone who's been to one of my talks will have seen this before. Uh, this is the idea that you can split the sky into 360 degrees. And because we're astronomers, we like to have strange units. And if you were to take one of those degrees, so one 360th of the circle, and split that into 60 chunks, you would arrive at what we call the arc minute. And if you were to split that further into 60 chunks of 1 60th of an arc minute, then gives you the arc second, which is a number which will come up a few times during this presentation. Um, so on the right here, we have a graphic showing you how you know you can get a rough gauge for how big these things are on the night sky. So you have sort of various hold your arm at arm's length. That should be roughly 25 degrees from your point of view. Uh, 5, 10, 15, all the way down to 1 degree, which is your sort of the width of your little finger held at arm's length. So I'm saying that one arc second is 1 3,600th of your little finger held at arm's length. So you can imagine that's already quite a small angle. And that's just to sort of give you a feeling of what one arc second is as we go through this presentation. OK, so with that in mind, we can start talking again with our simplified telescope about the plate scale. Um, so 
on the sky, as I said, things have a sort of angular separation of objects and the telescope one of the things it does is it converts that into a physical separation at the uh, focal plane, which as I discussed earlier is where you would put your camera and how large a separation at the focal plane you get for a given angular separation for a telescope is defined by the plate scale here. Uh, and because we're astronomers, this is typically expressed in arc seconds per millimeter and is given by this equation here. So this number divided by the focal length. So again, the distance from your mirror or lens to the focal point of your telescope uh, expressed in millimeters. So this graphic really gives you an idea of what I'm talking about. You have the light from two different stars shown by the red rays and the blue rays coming from slightly different angles on the night sky. And you can see they're reflected off of the mirror here and they arrive in focus at two separate points at the focal point plane separated by a physical distance. And again, to give you a sort of appreciation for what this, uh, how big this is, um, Jupiter typically has a angular diameter of 50 arc seconds on the night sky. Um, and so for my eight inch telescope I have at home, which has a focal length of 1.2 meters, the image of Jupiter using the above equation would be uh, 0.29 millimeters or 290 microns across, which is quite small. Um, but then the pixels on most CCDs are roughly tens of microns across as well. So they match quite nicely. So with that, um, you can already build a form of telescope simulator. And this is where most tools that you'll find online for telescope simulators sort of stop typically. You can sort of input the focal length of your telescope and define the pixel size and the number of pixels on your detector. And it will give you a simulated view here of what you could expect to see through your telescope on the night sky um, in terms of magnification. However, this doesn't account for any diffraction or atmospheric effects, which is what we're interested in and we're gonna talk about. But already we can see we're starting to build our model of uh, our telescope. Can I ask you a question, Dan? Yeah. Um, is the reason that they don't usually include like diffraction or atmospheric effects just because that's so complicated and like depends on where it would be or whatever? Because I guess I'm thinking that it kind of feels like it wouldn't be very useful as a simulator if it didn't include those things. Like, I, you know what I mean? Yeah, so I mean, these things are just kind of really useful for giving you an idea of how big something would look on your detector. Um, yeah, so that's like a one, so that it has a use, but then you're right, like this, obviously diffraction and atmospheric effects would be nice. Uh, diffraction wouldn't be too hard to include yeah. because you're essentially just uh, need to know the size of the telescope you're looking through. Yeah. But atmospheric effects are a bit harder because it's obviously, uh, as we'll talk about, it's a semi-random process, like yeah. what the actual view through the telescope is at any given time. So you start having to build some kind of like statistical models or making uh, GIFs of how the view would look as a function of time. Great. Cool. Uh, is that uh, it's not Matthias coming in? There we go. Okay. Um, if that answers your question, we can take a look at diffraction. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar, this is sort of the fundamental limit of how small an object you can resolve on the night sky, completely ignoring the effects of the atmosphere. And it's uh, defined by this equation here where theta is the smallest angle you can resolve on the night sky, so the smallest separation of two objects you could resolve, um, and is dependent on lambda, the wavelength you're observing at, so shorter wavelengths better, which is why radio images typically um, seem to have a much lower resolution than images taken in the optical, uh, and it's also dependent on the diameter of your telescope, d, so here it's obviously inversely proportional, so a larger telescope, the better your resolution. 
And this is one of the drives to build larger and larger telescopes, um, second to the fact that obviously the larger a telescope you have, the larger an area you have to collect light and so the fainter an object you can see. Um, and it's worth saying that this diffraction is the best you can ever do with a given telescope. The atmosphere is only going to make things worse. So that's just something to bear in mind. Um, so the idea of diffraction leads to what we call the PSF or the point spread function. So for an ideal telescope, uh, in this case, ideal specifically means an infinitely large telescope, which I'm sure many astronomers would love to have. Um, a star which is unresolved, so a star which is uh, too small to be resolved at the magnification you're observing at, should appear as a perfect point source. It would have no physical width on the detector, it would just be a literal point of light. Um, however, due to diffraction, an unresolved star in any real-world telescope still has a finite width on the detector, and the profile of this unresolved star is uh, known as the airy disk, um, and it's shown here. So you have sort of a, and this is a cross section cutting along the airy disk here. So you have sort of a very bright central peak, and then what we call the side lobes of much lower intensity sort of rippling out from the center. Um, and the profile this unresolved star has in reality is referred to as the point spread function because it's the function of how a point spreads uh, on your detector due to the diffraction of the telescope. Um, so what kind of effects does this have? So on the left here, and you're going to see this image a lot through this talk, you have the image of Jupiter from the Hubble Space Telescope, which is obviously a lovely uh, 2.4 meter mirror up above the Earth's atmosphere. So this is uh, more or less a completely diffraction limited image with a 2.4 meter mirror. And on the right, I have taken this image and processed it uh, processed it through the simulation that we will be using uh, tomorrow. And this is for an eight inch telescope, uh, sort of the same caliber of telescope I have at home as an amateur. And you can see how the fine structures and details in Jupiter are kind of lost and kind of blurred out by this process of diffraction. So you can think of this um, basically as a form of blurring, but this information from here to here is lost. And as I said, for an eight inch telescope, this is the best you can ever do. This is without the effects of the atmosphere. Um, and it's only going to get worse from there. Um, yes. OK, so next we want to start talking of including the atmosphere into our model so we want to start talking about wave fronts um, so a way that you can represent light coming from the sky uh, is via the electromagnetic wave and representing it by what we call the complex amplitude uh, so we'll walk through this essentially we have it described by this equation here where this value is the uh, maximum amplitude of the wave. So if we're looking here, this is the sort of peak of the blue curve here, the maximum value the wave can ever take. Uh, and the uh, psi here is the instantaneous value of the wave, which is given by this blue dot here. So you can see this oscillates um, between minus the amplitude and plus the amplitude. Um, and phi here, is the phase of the wavefront. So that essentially just tells you how far along in the cycle of this wave you are, because obviously you can see this is a sinusoid. This thing just repeats. And this phi just contains the information of what part of a wave you're looking at at any given time. Um, and then if we were to project this into what we're talking about for light coming from the night sky is obviously a 2D effect. Um, you can consider this rectangle drawn here as if you take this and you twist it and put it where this green line is. This, this graphic on the bottom here is essentially showing you the same thing. Um, so these colors here represent different phases of the wave. And what this is showing you is that light passing through this rectangle um, 
all the light at any uh, plane at any point through this rectangle has a constant phase. Uh, so all the light passing through this rectangle is at the same position in the cycle of this wave. And we call that a plane wave. And that is essentially what we model the light coming from uh, outer space as, as a wave where if you take a plane, it has a constant amplitude and the same phase everywhere across that. So that's your ideal wave. Uh, ask, please do stop me if you want to sort of take another look at that. But if we're OK with that, we can uh, then take this idea of a plane wave. So again, at the top of the atmosphere, we have our perfect plane waves. So these flat lines here represent the lines of constant phase I was talking about before. Um, and then they enter Earth's atmosphere where there are atmospheric turbulence generated by high up in the atmosphere processes such as wind shear at the interface between different regions of the atmosphere or closer to the ground. This can, uh, these turbulences can arise from wind striking sort of rocks or trees or other sort of uh, structures which disrupt the wind and uh, cause it to flow in funny ways. And these turbulences will cause uh, layers, different layers of the atmosphere to mix. Um, and these different layers are typically at different temperatures. And these different temperatures have different densities for the air, and hence they have different refractive indices. So uh, the speed of light, so taking that forward, the fact of different refractive indices, the speed of light through a medium is defined by this equation here, where uh, V is the velocity of light through medium, C the speed of light in the vacuum, and N the refractive index of the medium. So we can see here that the velocity of the light through the medium uh, depends on its refractive index. And if here we have uh, the different densities with different refractive indices mixing, then at a line along here, any slice will have different, uh, the wave will have different velocities passing through that slice of the atmosphere, which means that some parts of the wave will travel slower and some parts travel faster. So you'll take this perfect sort of plane wave with constant phase and it will start to shift as one goes faster, one part of the wave goes faster, one part goes slower. And obviously it's a much more complicated process than just these two parts here. Um, and that turns our perfect plane wave into what we have here at the bottom, what we sometimes refer to as uh, corrugated wave fronts because they're just kind of corrugated and no longer flat. Um, and this is the essence of atmospheric blurring and where the problems of uh, losing resolution due to the atmosphere come in. Okay, so with that, that's kind of the theory behind it. And then if we were to take that knowledge, we can start sort of analyzing uh, practical observations with that. So this blurring, as I said, this turbulence is caused by high altitude effects, but also more local ones that you can control. For example, the airflow coming from the ocean is typically a pretty good approximation to what we call a laminar flow. So this is just where the air is flowing uh, parallel to the uh, flat body of water here. And so we don't have the different layers of the atmosphere mixing. And so it's all stable and there's no blurring introduced from that. So if we're observing at site A where we have the nice uh, non-mixed air coming from off the ocean, we can expect a much higher sort of resolution picture of, uh, in this case, Jupiter again. However, if we're at site B where the air has passed over a mountain range and has become very sort of uh, mixed as it hits various rocks, uh, and becomes very turbulent, then we're going to end up with the uh, terrible seeing that I was talking about before. So the first tip here is if you can observe near the ocean, I guess. Not always uh, hugely practical, but if you're someone like ESO, the European Southern Observatory, 
you can choose your sites near the coast so you'll have a relatively stable air coming from over the ocean and that's what they have done here so you can see the majority of uh, ESO sites are located quite near the coast in Chile but it's not just these sort of uh, big scale effects there's also sort of more local effects um, where we can, if you have uh, your telescope here, um, then, well, you can consider heat radiating from uh, your house behind you will also cause very local turbulence, which will uh, worsen your seeing. Um, and telescopes, especially ones with solid tubes like this one, will have a column of obviously warm air if it's been inside the house for a significant period of time. Um, and so if you take that outside, that warm air is going to start mixing with the colder air outside and is going to cause turbulence um, just in front of your telescope, which is going to ruin your view as well, which is why uh, you sort of uh, want to take the telescope outside and cool it down to ambient temperatures beforehand if you can. Okay, so with that said, so that's a bit about uh, practical tips for observing and the sort of theory behind uh, atmospheric blurring. Are there any questions at this stage before we start? Uh, excuse me, before we start to talk about how to characterize that. Uh, just a quick question: If mm -hmm. could, uh, why, why why don't anybody put? uh like telescope on boats or somewhere out in the ocean where there's lots of free space you or could do too expensive uh i think the main problem with that is the pointing so if you put a boat if you put it on a boat then it's obviously gonna um shake around quite a bit hmm. or like a um, oil platform or something that is out of out of operation yeah that's not a terrible idea it could work but there's also a second so, I mean, the first thing is you need a very stable platform mm. and potentially uh, an oil rig could be stable enough, um, but I'm not entirely sure. But obviously, as I said, you're talking about really small angles. So even tiny vibrations will upset your observing. Um, but the other point is most observatories like the uh, stable airflow from over the ocean, but they also want to be on top of a mountain. Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah. Because another way, another way you can minimize the effects of the atmosphere is to put your telescope as high up above as much of the atmosphere as you can. Mm -hmm. Which, okay. yeah, is not very practical for most people. Okay. Any other questions? Or I, sorry, I had to run far away to unmute myself. Um, I was going to say, you could kind of solve the pointing problem with a Sophia like setup I would suppose like Sophia also runs into the same thing right like putting a telescope in a plane so yeah if it weren't for the high altitude thing I would say that maybe that would solve the problem if you ever wanted to put a telescope on the ocean but yeah, yeah. no that's a really good point I suppose like it has kind of been done before right if it can be uh if they can get a telescope working in a plane they can probably get one working on a platform in the ocean I mean, yeah, it's the same and with like satellites because they are not they're like moving pretty fast. Yeah. Well, I guess I, I think you would have to worry about the minute vibrations. Like, mm. oh, I don't know, which I which actually I have no idea how how satellites how bad that would be in a satellite. But and, yeah, well, you have a lot of stabilizers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. True. Yeah, I mean, uh, Hubble had what like six gyroscopes or something. <laughs> I know some of them were like backups, but still. Yeah, you, that's at least double because of redundancy, especially yeah, Hubble, yeah. which is out there for forever at this point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting concept. If we can build a really high platform in the ocean, we probably create the best observing <laughs> site uh, that you could ever hope for. Mm. Something to think about. Okay. <laughs> Next, Any uh, other questions? <laughs> yeah, exactly, right. Next PhD project. Any other questions or Okay. Um, so the next section is uh how bad is it? So I've told you 
what causes this and uh, how you can minimize it, but how bad actually is it? So for telescopes larger than around 10 centimeters in diameter, they are uh, no longer limited by diffraction. So we have our friend the airy disk again from before, but now they're limited by seeing. So any telescope, uh, which I think is like a really sort of gives you a real handle on how bad atmospheric blurring can be. Any telescope larger than 10 centimeters is just the atmosphere is going to be the dominant problem in reducing your resolution. So obviously if we're talking about like a eight meter telescope, like the uh, very large telescope, that is very much uh, dominated by atmospheric effects. But then you can start to develop uh, adaptive optic systems, et cetera, which is a whole different topic. But anyway, the point is here on the left, we have the diffraction limited PSF, point spread function for a telescope. And on the right, we have the uh, same telescope setup. However, we have atmospheric seeing where here, and this is something that will make more sense in a couple of slides, the telescope is 10 times the freed parameter. So I'll be defining that in a couple of slides, so just keep that in your head. But basically, we can go from the star being this small very easily to appearing this sized on your detector. So that's how bad the atmospheric blurring can be. So you can characterize it in a couple of ways. The first one is the uh, full width half maxima. And this is typically what people quote when they talk about seeing. Uh, so you can do this by pointing your telescope at a point source star and measuring the full width half maxima of it. So here we have a star which should be a point source in the ideal world. It obviously has been uh, atmospherically blurred out to a much larger object. And here we have the cross section, so the intensity profile uh, sweeping across it. You can see it's a sort of nice Gaussian profile and you can measure the full width path maximum represented by this gray box here. And that tells you the sort of seeing that you have on sky. So obviously on the detector, we're talking about uh, this star will have a physical dimension. However, you can convert that back using the plate scale that we talked about before to a sort of angular uh, dimension on the sky. And that angle you would quote in arc seconds, and that is what we would refer to as our seeing. Um, so for example, here we have the monthly average seeing at, I believe this is the uh, very large telescope observatory site. And you can see this is quoted, as I said, in arc seconds. And it sort of ranges from what about 0.6 to about 1.3 arc seconds. Um, and you can see that for some reason, December seems to be a particularly good time to uh, go observing. So obviously the smaller this value is, the uh, smaller the stars will appear and the more like point sources they will appear like and the better your observations. Um, so this kind of gives you a guide of uh, what how good the seeing can be. And obviously going back to what we talked about before, uh, your finger at arm's length, the width of that divided into 3,600 even chunks is one arc second. So we're talking about quite a small angle that this atmosphere is limiting you to. But when you're dealing with stuff in astronomy, this is still very significant. Um, so a second way of characterizing seeing is via what we call the freed parameter um, or R naught. And this is typically expressed in centimeters. So the textbook definition <laughs> is the diameter of a circular area over which the RMS wavefront aberration due to the passage of a plane wave through the atmosphere is equal to one radian. Um, so that's just saying how big, uh, well, yes, essentially the length scale over which turbulence becomes significant, meaning a telescope larger than freed parameter will be uh, limited by the atmosphere rather than diffraction. Uh, Hang on, just admitting someone else. Perfect. OK. Oh, yes. Um, I also can't really see the text box when I have the presenter view up. So someone, if you don't see me responding to a message, please speak up and let me know. Anyway, so yes. So essentially, you can consider R0 as the maximum size of your telescope 
for it to still be diffraction limited and not limited in resolution by the atmosphere. So at visible wavelengths are good seeing conditions. For example, on the top of a mountain, you can expect R0 to be around 10 centimeters, as I talked about before. Um, so sort of taking a step back from how you can characterize seeing to talking again about uh, how uh, seeing can vary um, depending on your observational setup. I want to talk about air mass as well, because it's something that you can play around with in the simulation. Um, so air mass measures the amount of air you're looking through at any given time. So it's defined as being equal to one for an object directly overhead um, at the zenith. So we have this uh, helpful astronomer here demonstrating that if he's looking directly up, you see this star and you can see you're looking through the minimum amount of atmosphere. Um, and then we have this angle defined that we call the zenith angle. So this is just the angle in degrees away you are from looking directly upwards. Um, so this obviously increases as you move towards the horizon. And the closer to the horizon you are, um, the more air you're going to be looking through and the worse your seeing is going to be. Um, so to give you a kind of handle on that, you can look at it by this graph here. So if you assume the Earth is flat, um, which I'm not saying it is, but if you assume that, then you can get the simple model that the uh, air mass is given by the sec of the zenith angle. Um, so obviously it starts at one, and then here we have a cut in this diagram, and this model is called the parallel model, sorry. And here you have a cut in this diagram from 80 degrees up to 90 degrees from the zenith angle. Um, so 80 degrees down from zenith. And you can see that, hang on, just gonna admit someone else. And yes, so you can see uh, as we start off this plane parallel model, so assuming the Earth is flat and the atmosphere is completely parallel, um, is a good approximation up until about 80 degrees where these models start to diverge. And you can see just how quickly the air mass starts to pick up. So again, this is the number of times the amount of air when you're looking directly up, you're looking through. So as you get towards the horizon, you start looking through crazy amounts, sort of 30 times uh, as much air as if you're looking uh, directly above. And that is not good. So in terms of uh, atmospheric blurring, what this can do is the uh, greater your air mass, the worse you're seeing. So this is from the simulation here. We have Jupiter at a zenith angle of zero degrees, so directly overhead. And you can see the image is moderately good. You can see uh, in a number of the frames, you can see some of the finer features. Obviously, they're kind of blurred out in between. Um, however, at the right, on the right here, you have Jupiter at a zenith angle of 60 degrees, so much lower down and closer to the horizon. And you can see this is just more of a mess. <laughs> more of your images will be uh, very badly distorted, and the sort of average level of distortion will be much worse. It's a bit of a, it's slightly subtle, but uh, hopefully you can see the uh, difference between the two observations here. Um, okay, so air mass and seeing. So if we want to now thread this uh, expression for air mass back to uh, a quantity for how bad the seeing is, you can arrive at this uh, expression here where it tells you the freed parameter. If you take your freed parameter at the zenith, so freed parameter we discussed earlier, the maximum size your telescope can be before the atmosphere starts to be a problem. And if you're looking directly up, say your freed parameter is 10 centimeters, then as you increase your zenith angle, your seeing is going to get worse and the maximum telescope you can use is going to decrease by this function here. And as you can see, by the time you get to the horizon, you're starting to approach zero. It very dramatically drops off. 
Um, so the atmosphere is getting worse and worse. And one more point in terms of air mass is not only does it affect uh, the quality of your seeing, but it also affects how bright stars appear in the night sky. Um, and this is due to increased levels of scattering and absorption as the light passes through more air. So you can see here on the right, uh, the magnitude of a star as it was observed with the telescope as a function of air mass. And you can see it getting uh, fainter as the amount of air you're looking through increases. Um, so with that, that brings us to the end of the first part. In this section, I'm going to sort of give you a very, uh, very loose overview of how you can, of how we're going to go about simulating this. Um, I'm going to avoid trying to talk in too much detail about the specific procedures for a lot of the stuff, um, mainly because if that's what you're interested in, we can work sort of more one-on-one -on, -one on that later to go over um, the details of it. But for now, we're going to have a very sort of high level overview of how you go about simulating this. Um, OK, so the first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to define the image you're inputting into the simulation. So as you've seen in the previous slides that I've shown you, I start with this beautiful uh, Hubble image of Jupiter. Um, and the thing we need to know is we need to know the angular size of this image on sky. So this, the simulation handles this by being passed the variable angular pixel size input image. Uh, you'll see in my code, I name my variables very literally, uh, mainly for myself uh, to remember what everything is supposed to be. Um, and this is essentially the angular scale, the angular size of each pixel um, on the sky. And there are two ways you can find this out for the image you're wanting to load in. The first one is if you know the angular size of the object in your image. Um, you can take that and divide it by how many pixels across that object is in your image. So that's what I did for the example of Jupiter. You know, it's sort of 50 arc seconds across and 700 pixels, 50 over 700. There's your angular size per pixel. Um, or for a given camera on a given telescope, the angular pixel size is fixed. And so you'll sometimes find this is quoted in the specs of the uh, telescope and instrument itself. Um, so yes, and then the simulation, you take this information and using the plate scale equation again, you're able to convert this angular size of the image into the physical size this image will appear on your detector in the telescope you're simulating. So that's your image. The next step is uh, for simulating our telescope itself. Then you will need to sort of look at the following parameters. So you need to tell it how big the telescope is in meters, um, the focal length of the telescope, because obviously this defines um, how large the image appears, the wavelength we wish to observe at in meters. Um, and this is our first big approximation here. Uh, we're dealing with color images, as you've seen with the images of Jupiter, but I'm defining it at a single wavelength, assuming the image is monochromatic, just for uh, simplicity. Um, so yes, yeah, something to just be aware of. Uh, you also need to tell it the pixel size of your camera or CCD uh, and the pixel count, the number of pixels your CCD is comprised of. And currently, the simulation only works with square uh, arrays just because that makes things easier. Um, you can always crop it later if you really want a rectangular array. Um, so that's how you would define the telescope to set it up. And then the next thing it's going to do is take this information and simulate the telescope pupil. So everything I talked about for telescopes, this image here is essentially our telescope as far as the simulation is concerned. Um, you can see here we have a 2D array, uh, just an image basically, where the value is 1 represented by yellow inside the telescope pupil and 0 outside the pupil. Um, sorry, so the pupil is what we refer to as the, um, 
the space in which the aperture of the telescope takes up, so the diameter of the lens or the diameter of the mirror in your telescope. So this is essentially a simulation of what the mirror at the back of our telescope looks like. And just uh, for those of you who will be looking at the code, here's a way to find where this is defined. Um, so great, so we've defined our telescope and we have our image of the telescope in the simulation. The next step is going to be to deal with the phase, to deal with the atmosphere. And this is through a concept known as phase screens. Um, so if you'll recall, I said the atmosphere uh, produces turbulence, which causes some of the plane wave to move faster, some to travel slower, and causes some kind of, uh, uh, causes it to mix up and have a sort of non-uniform phase across the uh, wave. This is essentially what we need to simulate. And this is what's been shown on the right here. So this phase screen is essentially a patch of the sky in physical dimensions. So if I'm simulating a eight inch telescope, the simulation will generate a eight inch patch on the sky. So this would be eight inches across here, eight inches across here. Um, and this, the color map here is showing you the phase of the so the uh, position of the wave at each individual sample point in this sort of 2D space on the sky, um, as compared to what should be a perfect flat uh, value, so a single value for a perfect plane wave. Um, so a little bit about these sort of phase screens. They uh, look like they are what we call fractal structures. Um, so the sort of uh, structure on the larger scales looks like a scaled up version of the structure on the smaller scales. And yes, they do look like clouds and they're supposed to because clouds are caused by turbulence and have, so they're caused by the same kind of uh, physics in the atmosphere. And so they have the same structure, which I think is just a cool, neat little way that everything ties together. Um, so just to hopefully make those phase screens a little bit clearer, what we are doing now is we essentially coming back to this function of how we represent our light in our system, the wave coming in. Um, so psi naught here is the uh, telescope pupil. So this is uh, on our, so we're no longer sampling in one position in space. This is over a 2D sort of array, like a physical space. Um, so this is saying, at any point in this 2D space, the value is either one if you're inside the telescope uh, aperture inside the mirror or zero outside. So essentially, you know, the wave doesn't exist. Um, and then we have the phase information, as I talked about before here, this phi term, and that is encoded in the phase screen I just showed you. Uh, so this corrugated wave front here is a phase screen. So if we go back and we take this image, which is essentially sort of looking directly up at the sky, this 2D array, and we sort of rotate it and slide it in here, this is what the uh, phase screen is showing us. It's showing us a deviation of the phase across this 2D surface um, as a function of position. So is that clear or do we want to talk about that a bit more, because that's sort of one of the weirder concepts. OK. Again, I'll take your silence for uh, happiness with that. Um, so we then want to take this phase screen, um, and then we need to multiply it with the telescope aperture to get us to this. So this here is again our telescope. And um, here outside, you can see it's all one value uh, by the color map, so zero. No light exists outside of this uh, telescope aperture. And within the telescope, you can see the phase, uh, the amplitude of the instantaneous amplitude of the light hitting the mirror 
is uh, different at different portions of the uh, mirror due to the atmospheric turbulence. Um, so this is the sort of crux of the uh, how you set up the simulation. Okay. So then if we take that and then we uh, perform a, uh, we take the sort of pupil, the sort of uh, light coming in, hitting the mirror, and then we transform that, transform that to the focal plane. So we turn that sort of uh, collimated aperture, collimated beam of light, and we focus it to a point source, as your telescope does to where the detector would go. Then we get something like this. So on the left here, we have the diffraction limited uh, point spread function again. So you can see the sort of uh, dot and maybe even the ring around it, the Vieri disk. And then if we are to add atmosphere, we arrive at something like this. So this is what the atmospheric perturbations cause your image to do. They will turn your uh, perfect stationary point source for the star into this sort of semi-random uh, pattern of light blurring in all these directions. And this, these images here vary on the timescales of milliseconds. Um, and as you can see, it's sort of, you can imagine it's filling in light in various portions of this uh, array on the detector. And so if you uh, image for a second or two, this will all blur out into one uh, fuzzy blob, which is given here. So this is how we went. So this is in reality how you go from your diffraction limited image to this huge blob. Um, but this is what actually comes out of the simulation for any single uh, sample of the atmosphere that you make. So essentially, we have our PSF here now. And we want to uh, take that and through a process uh, known as convolution, which again, we can talk more about if you're interested. You take this uh, point spread function image and you convolve it with the input image that you are wanting to sample. And that is the essentially the whole process of what you're trying to do. Um, and the result of that operation is the atmospherically blurred image at the output. So that leads you, so that takes your Hubble image, you convolve it with the uh, PSFs we had here on the previous slide, and that returns this kind of image here. Um, and as I said, you have the various, uh, the point spread function varies randomly from sample to sample, which is why you get a different image of Jupiter in this case for every sample of the atmosphere that you take. So here, what I'm doing is I'm just taking a bunch of those and looping it together into an image to present what would be a sort of live view through the telescope. Um, so the final step is just to sort of uh, interpolate the image you produced and sort of resample it for, onto your detector itself. And then you just need to export the image as uh, whatever you want, JPEGs, GIFs, or AVI files, uh, as you can see here. And so how was that? That's sort of like a very broad overview of uh, the process you would go through to code this. Does anyone have any questions at this stage? Yes. Um. Shoot. This I'm going to ask like the the obvious one, which is, can you go the other way? <laughs> like, wouldn't you want to use this framework to take a, you know, PSF image into a non PSF one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you can do that mathematically, um, and this is a sort of. Uh, this is a process that they call it deconvolution, uh, trying to remove the effects of the PSF. And so if you have a sort of uh, lens in a very stable environment where the PSF doesn't change, so like this perfect diffraction limited one, 
then that's relatively easy. Um, but because this, the atmosphere is kind of a random uh, process, it's very, you don't actually know what the PSF is at any one time. So if you don't know exactly what the PSF is, the... it's very, go on. Yeah, could you do it with a, could you do it with a simulation? Like if you like had simulated data with like that is a simulated um, image that you like w with some simulated like um, convolution and then like go backwards and then you, I don't know. Yeah, no, definitely. I'm gonna like, try this. I'm gonna try this tomorrow. <laughs> please do. Like, you, can, you can definitely do that with the simulation. You can like generate these images. You can convolve it and generate these images. And then if you have the stored PSF, you can go backwards and recover your perfect yeah. image. Like you can definitely do that, but like in practice, you don't know. You can never know the point spread function well enough to. Yeah. Uh, to get that out and do that in real life. Um, yeah. Plus on top of that, you have that typically if you're exposing for a number of seconds, you go from like, you stack thousands of these PSS on top of each other into this blob. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you can't really remove uh, or each individual PSF then. Right. But yeah, you can definitely do that in the simulation. I have a uh, question about like generating exam, like essentially this random atmosphere layer. So you're uh -huh. mentioning that you're kind of, you're making some random fractal structure essentially, but yeah. wouldn't also the structure itself of the fractals change over time? Like, I mean, like different kind of turbulence may make different sort of patterns, or is this just a good enough approximation? I mean, obviously we don't know how they actually look, so. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, uh, so I think, uh, essentially, yes, this is kind of taking the information about how bad the atmosphere is, and then there's a software package, which was actually uh, written by my supervisor, which is buried in this simulation, which takes that information and generates these phase screens. Um, so for, and then for each uh, PSF you generate, so each frame in the movie you generate, you're using a different phase screen, which causes different uh, perturbations and then gets you the different PSFs you see sort of bouncing around here, which is why you get the sort of uh, different shaking motions and blurring between frames. I think that answers your question. Or... Yeah, no, no, pretty much. It was essentially just like the degree to which we're randomizing these uh, these face screens. Yeah, so um, yeah, so there's a model that you can, uh, there's a way of modeling this essentially, which is uh, what, it, uh, what the software simulation uh, package does for generating the face screens. And if you're if we're interested in, if you're interested in that we can take some uh, we can take a deeper look at that tomorrow in the code. Okay. I have Any other questions? Um, uh, can you actually measure the the face? Uh, that is a very good question. Uh, no, uh, I wish we could, but the problem is that visible light oscillates on time scales of, uh, I believe it's uh, 10 to the minus 15 seconds. Um, and we don't have any uh, detectors which can read out that quickly. So essentially what we just see is the time averaged uh, version of the light coming in. So by the time we read our detector, the phase has already changed so much on our detector, but we just see the time average uh, wave. We don't actually see the uh, phase itself. So it's a matter of uh, velocity more than anything else. It, like, we could actually measure it if we were fast enough. Yeah, you could, uh, you could see the light train uh, sort of uh, pulsing in amplitude if you were fast enough, hmm. but we don't have that technology. 
Actually, I did Google it earlier. I think there was a paper which claimed to do it, but I didn't uh, look into that too much. But yeah, certainly for sort of uh, astronomical observations, and if you're wanting to expose for a number of seconds to try and integrate as much light as you can, then there's uh, you're not going to be able to see the uh, see the effects of the phase itself directly, just the time averaged version. Um, just another question, building on that actually. Um... Would it be any useful to take, because you're saying you see the basically the, a lot of screens on top of each other, if you expose for, I don't know, let's say a couple of seconds, but mm -hmm. could you basically, I mean, we have perfect images of, for example, Jupiter from Hubble. Could you then take, basically take a picture of Jupiter with, like take the Hubble picture of Jupiter, take the picture from your telescope of Jupiter, and basically through that get an idea of or like get an estimation for the screen and then if you're using your telescope to look at something else re like basically use the screen you got from the jupiter image to then like it's not going to be perfect but if you look at another object you may be able to improve your result uh with the calibration from the jupiter image yeah so you can definitely like um, I'm sure there's a way of uh, extracting the point spread function with that process, these kind of things here, right? Mm. Um, but the problem with getting the phase screen itself is that the sort of uh, the badness of the seeing, for lack of a better word, would be more or less the same between sort of images. Um, but as you can see, the sort of... Uh, structure of each individual screen is very different between each sample, which is why each like uh, PSF here looks really different to the last one. Oh, okay. So, and this is uh, sort of on the time scale of uh, milliseconds. Is this also similar to what ESO is doing at the VLT with like the giant orange lasers that they shoot up and use them as like reference stars? Yeah, so uh, that's, uh, adaptive optics which is uh, another kettle of fish um but oh, that is okay. essentially yeah no but this like you it's you're completely right in the sense they're trying to remove the atmospheric blurring but what they're doing is they have a what they call a shack hartman sensor which is a and we can talk more about this later if you're interested but it's essentially a tool for measuring um the atmospheric perturbations at any given time so as I said, these perturbations change on the timescales of milliseconds. So what the shark Hartman does is it samples how the wavefront is uh, perturbed, like the shape of these contours. And it takes a physical mirror and deforms that mirror to sort of uh, match, to sort of be the anti-opposite of the corrugated wavefront here so that it returns like a perfect wavefront. So, you know, if this is a... Uh, bit too far forward, the mirror will be further back at this point in space to bring this part of the wavefront in line with this part to try and get like a flat, perfect wavefront again. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's completely crazy. And as I said, this is like on the time scale of milliseconds, like so thousands of times a second, this mirror is like physically deforming to try and correct for the Earth's atmosphere. That is crazy. <laughs> yeah. This is why I love instrumentation. This is like the, yeah, this that you get to work with this kind of equipment is just really, really cool. And I'm hoping someday I can steal it and take it home <laughs> to build my own telescope. Nice. But yeah, so um, you can't actually measure the PSFs really, but in practical terms, you can remove nearly all the effects of Earth's atmosphere with these adaptive optics, which is a sort of another topic. And the lasers themselves are used because they know then they generate like a perfect, what should be a perfect light source in the sky. And then they can look how that light source has been corrupted and then process what must be going on in the atmosphere to have corrupted it like that and correct that. Really cool stuff. Um, any other questions then? Okay, uh, in which case, 
I will flash this on the screen, not necessarily to go over it now, but this is just for when you're looking at the code. Uh, this is sort of a overview of the a sort of flow chart of the process that actually goes on to, to help you follow along tomorrow. Um, so we can look more of that later. Uh, so just a sort of uh, side sort of step of what fun you can have with this simulation, what you can do. Uh, so the first thing that it can do is, as I've shown you, you can see what the diffraction limited uh, image should look like uh, from a given telescope. And so you can take a perfect image and generate what the diffraction limited perfect-ish image should look like through your telescope. So you can compare how close your observations are to the uh, best it version you would be able to get with your telescope. The zenith angle feature as well, as you've seen before in that GIF, allows you to simulate the expected view of an object for a certain altitude above the horizon. So it can be a useful tool if you're wondering if it's worth getting up at 4 a.m. to view Jupiter when it's 20 degrees above the horizon. Um, it's probably not, but here you can actually sort of simulate what that view should look like before you go ahead and do that. Um, and lastly, the sort of fun one that I'll show you on the next slide is that you can export these images and then import them into sort of astrophotography processing tools to try and like uh, stack them for those of you familiar with that concept to try and generate like a uh, uh, the best image that you can from the simulated data set, which is, uh, yeah. So talk a bit about that now. So there's a free program called Registax, which I've used before, where you take the atmospherically perturbed uh, images that I showed you that you've seen in the GIFs before, and through a process of uh, lucky imaging and shift and adding, you can create an image with minimal effects of the atmosphere. So lucky imaging is the concept where you take all your images and you uh, sort of rank them by how good they are, how close they are to being a diffraction limited perfect image. And you sort of make a cut and you throw away the bad ones and you keep the good ones. And then shift and add, you take those good ones and you shift them so that they're all perfectly on top of each other. And you take the sort of average of all of those images to create sort of like the um, best image you can with minimal atmospheric effects. So that's something that I did here. Um, so on the left here, you have the diffraction limited image. Uh, so this is the, as I said before, many times the best image you could hope to get with a telescope. For, so in this case, an eight inch telescope again. And in the center, you have the uh, blurred individual images from the telescope. So you can see some are quite good, like one just there, um, which you would keep, and some are terrible, which you would throw away through what we call lucky imaging, which I think is a beautiful name because it's essentially saying, you know, you're taking the moments of time when you were lucky and got a really good view of the really stable moment of the Earth's atmosphere. And by taking these and putting it through the uh, software, you can recover an image that looks like this. So this is going from diffraction limited to the sort of uh, to these images with the atmosphere on, and then processing all these images to produce the best image I can here, and you can sort of compare the two and see how close you can get, and you see that you can actually do a really like a really kind of reasonable job. You see like some of the finer features, like I don't know if you can see this dark band here, is not as pronounced, uh, and some of the really high sort of tiny details are lost but you can recover an almost diffraction limited image through this uh, processing software, which you can uh, have a play around with tomorrow if that's uh, of interest to you.